We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, whoa, hey, good morning church. That one surprised even me. Happy to see you all. I often say that it's a good Sunday when my sleeves get wet. But sometimes your pants get wet too. I don't know if you can still see, but I was trying to dry off the last song. Anyway, uh, man, it seems like every Sunday here is a baptism Sunday. And this service, this 10 o'clock service, yeah, you, you all get to experience most of them. And that's a really cool, exciting thing. Hey, real fast, my name is Pastor Matt. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I would love to meet you after service, maybe out in the lobby or somewhere around um, cafe or whatever. I'm really glad that you're here. I know that uh, you, you might not believe like we do. You might not be sure about this church, but we want you to know that you belong here, and we're really glad that you're here. Uh, so thanks for being here with us. Uh, right now, we're in a series. We're going through the book of Daniel together. So I want to invite you to grab your copy of God's Word and open up to, to Daniel chapter 6. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 6 today. We're going to go through the whole chapter. So if you don't own a Bible, um, what I want you to do is grab the Bible from the chair in front of you and write your name in it and take it home with you because we want everyone in here to own a Bible on their way out, all right? So follow along. We're going to have some scripture on the screen as well. Uh, but really through this series, one of the questions I want to ask us to consider today is, is how do you thrive, essentially, when you're not living the life that you wanted? How do you thrive when you're not living the life you wanted? I mean, think about, I think about myself for a moment. I, I promise you, when I was younger, I expected to have a whole lot more hair at, at, at my age than I do. Right? This is not the, the hair I wanted. This is just kind of what God gave me. Okay? I expected when I was younger, I wanted to be a little bit more athletic. Uh, there was, I, I wanted some different skills. I wanted to be able to play the piano. I, and I, I kind of look back, and this, is, I'm like, this isn't the life I, I, I love the life I have. But what happens when you're not living the life you expected? And we look at Daniel. Daniel is an incredible example of this question. Because he's clearly, he, he's about 80 years old now. We've been working through, remember we started when he was a teenager, and now we're about when Daniel's about 80 years old, and he must be looking back at his life and thinking, this is not the life I wanted. I mean, think about this for a moment. Is he living where he wanted to live? No, right? He was taken from his hometown by force and put into this new place under captivity. This is clearly not the place he wants to be living think about his family. Like most young people, they want to have, maybe get married and have some children, and they have this kind of idea of what their family might look like when they're older. Well, Daniel, likely, when he was a teenage boy and was captured and brought into the king's service, most people believe at that moment he was made a eunuch, right? He was castrated. So he doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have children. This is not the life that he wanted. Think about where maybe he wanted to go to college, where he wanted to learn things, right? Obviously, he went by force to the University of Babylon. That's not where he wanted to go. And so we have this, this example of Daniel not living essentially the life that he would have expected. How do you thrive to a place where you can look back and say, I might not be where I wanted, but I'm right where God wants me to be? And so looking at that, we're going to start in Daniel chapter 6, and we got a lot of ground to cover. So let's, let's start. Uh, here in just a minute. But before I do, I want to share with you kind of the, the, the framework that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at essentially the culture's playbook. If you, anyone in here plays sports or you've ever been on a team before, you know that one of the best things you can do before you play another team is to study their playbook. 
right? If you're uh, 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 playing football and you got your whole uh, your defensive line, right, you want to know what plays are likely to come. When they line up a certain way because you've watched all the tape, you know that they're likely going to run this play or that play, and you can line up strategically to be ready to defend your, uh, you know, against that play. Well, we have an opportunity in Daniel chapter 6 to actually look at the enemy's playbook, the, the other teams, the culture's playbook. These are the plays that the culture likes to run over and over again. These are the plays that the culture would run back in this day, but the culture is still running the same plays today, and we have the ability to look at the book and open it up and see, and Daniel chapter 6 shows us a lot of those plays, all right? So I want to share them with you. Let's start in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. We're not going to get very far into this verse. It says, Darius the Mede decided. Let's pause right there for just a moment for context. You might be thinking, all right, we've heard about Nebuchadnezzar. You know, last week we were talking about some guy named Belshazzar, and now we're talking about Darius the Mede is deciding. Who's Darius the Mede, and why does he get to decide stuff, right? It it just kind of comes out of nowhere. We get Darius the Mede. Well, I want you to understand, Darius the Mede is essentially the new king. He's the one right now, you know, as Daniel is no longer a teenager, he's now in his 80s, and there's now a new king. And it's not even a Babylonian king anymore. Things have changed drastically. In fact, that's actually the first thing I want you to know about the culture's playbook, is the culture wants to keep believers guessing. The culture wants to make it so that you don't know what's coming next, to, to, to make sure that you don't get too comfortable or they want you to get comfortable so that they can surprise you with some sort of trick play. Right? The culture wants to keep you guessing. And you look at Daniel's experience, you're going to see there's been so many changes over time. I mean, parents in this room, you look back at your children, right? You look at the child that is sitting next to you right now, and you think, man, they have changed so much. It was just yesterday I was holding this, this little girl in my arms. So much changes over time. You know, there's a, a Republican in power, and then there's a Democrat in power, and then there's a Republican in power, and then there's a Democrat in power. The, the court leans this way, and then the court leans that way. And, then the court, and, and over time, you're just going to notice that everything just kind of shifts around and changes. That's part of the culture's playbook, is to keep everyone on their toes a little bit. And one of the ways that the culture likes to do that is to try to make, you know, you, you maybe run a play and run a play and run a play so that uh, in a way you start to get a little bit lulled into some confidence. You start to, to figure out that you've got the other team figured out and that. And right then, right, they run a trick play. They do something different that you weren't expecting. Well, the changes that we see in Daniel's life are pretty amazing, If you think back, remember we opened up Daniel and there was a king named King Nebuchadnezzar. Pastor Michael named him King Neb, right? We got King Neb. And he started off, right, as a a very egotistical, didn't recognize the one true God. Uh, And then in Daniel chapter 4, which is actually a chapter we skipped as we're teaching through Daniel, trying to do it fairly quickly, but go back and read Daniel chapter 4. What happens is King Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, and Daniel interprets that dream for him, and he essentially says, the dream says that you are going to go off into the wilderness and essentially go crazy and eat grass like cows do. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, oh, and certainly that's what happens. He goes crazy, he goes off and lives out in the wilderness for years and eats grass like cows and all this stuff happens. And until he's humbled to the point where he recognizes he is not God, there is only one true God. And Nebuchadnezzar comes back to his senses and goes back and, and kind of regains control of the kingdom. But now he recognizes that there is just one true God and that Nebuchadnezzar's not it. And l- let me say this really clearly. That sounds like a victory, Daniel very easily could have been like, look, we remained faithful and we did what we were supposed to do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, high five. We did what we were supposed to do. And now look, the king has now recognized that our God is the one true God. Victory. Listen, the church is going to experience a lot of victories. We're going to see seasons where things seem to go in the favor of the church and th- things seem to be moving and the gospel seems to be spreading and things happen to seem to be going well and, and, and uh, you know, oppression seems to be down and all those things. We're like, yes, victory! But listen, the culture wants us to, to kind of get into that habit of thinking we know what the play is. 
but, but really the playbook is to keep us guessing, right? To, to not really know what's coming next because things change so quickly. Because then Nebuchadnezzar, who, who now recognizes there's one true God, his son Belshazzar comes in. That's the one we, the king we learned about last week. He comes in and he does not recognize the one true God. He takes the stuff, right, from the, that they stole from Jerusalem, all the holy objects, and he uses them for debauchery and to, let's all have a big party and just make a, a silliness of all this stuff. And that's when the handwriting starts going up on the wall. And remember, Daniel comes in again under this new king and says, listen, this is what the handwriting says. Today's gonna be a really bad day for you. And sure enough, within that day, uh, the Babylonian Empire is essentially destroyed and the Medo-Persians come in and King Darius is now in charge of Daniel. King Darius. And that's why we read, you know, essentially that Darius the Mede decided. The culture is really good at kind of sneaking plays on us. Let me, let me give you an example of this. You ever notice that sometimes you'll, you'll find a new series on TV and you watch season one, you'll be very careful to watch it because you want to know whether or not, uh, can my kids watch this? Would I be okay with my 10-year-old you know, watching this? So we'll, we'll pay attention. And, and at the end of it, the whole series season goes by and we're thinking, wow, this was clean. There wasn't anything that I'd be kind of worried about my, my children consuming. And like, wow, this is kind of a cool thing. And so you get comfortable. And then what does the culture do? Season two comes out and wham, they throw it all in there. They get you comfortable and they sneak a play in. So the culture wants to kind of keep you, keep you guessing. Don't miss that. So Daniel 6, verse 1, let's keep reading. Darius the Mede decided, the new king, to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. And he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel, there he is, and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. There it happens again. Daniel rises to the top. He's not even from this place. He's not a Medo-Persian, right? The, now, now the Medo-Persians are in charge. King Darius sees all these people. He, he splits the, the, a bunch of governors and administrators, and he says, but you three, the, Daniel and these two other guys, you're gonna be like my, my justices of the Supreme Court. When someone's got an issue and they got a problem, they're gonna come through you and you're gonna see to the affairs of my kingdom. But then Daniel continues to stick out because of his character and his consistency. And the king says, Daniel, you though, you're gonna be the chief justice. You're in charge of all these other rulers. You're in charge. Pretty powerful. You see Daniel, you see the, his character, you see his consistency, and that's why he keeps standing out. In fact, what I want you to understand, one little quick thing we should all be able to learn from Daniel is that when you stay connected to the vine, you will bear much fruit. One of the things you're gonna see in here is that people were able to clearly see fruit in Daniel's life. The fruit was so obvious that of all the thousands of people that the king could have picked to put in charge of the kingdom, he's brand new, it's a brand new administration, he's setting up this whole thing, and he's like, already, that guy, I can just tell that guy stands out. Because Daniel was bearing fruit, and the fruit was obvious. And the same is true today, that when we stay connected to the vine, we will bear fruit. You think about King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the ways King Nebuchadnezzar described Daniel. He says, the spirit of God is in him. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar was able to see the fruits of the spirit in Daniel's life. And then you think about the, the chapter five that we read last week, right? It says that the queen mother was able to say to her son, Belshazzar, there's this guy named Daniel and the spirit of God is in him. She was able to recognize the fruits of the spirit growing in and through him. And now we see King Darius, who's recognizing the exact same thing. Daniel, there's something special about this guy. In fact, there's a New Testament verse, John 15, 5, that says this. Yes, I am the vine. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. 
When you stay connected to the vine, you will produce fruit, and that fruit will be obvious to other people. All right, so as Daniel, an outsider, is placed in this position, this number two role, guess what always happens when, when you get placed in a position of authority and someone else doesn't? Jealousy always seeks in, and that's exactly what happens. You know, it's funny. Uh, we're now talking about new people. We're not talking about the same people from, you know, the, the fiery furnace. Uh, new people, same sin nature. <laughs> it doesn't change. In fact, today, hundreds of years later, same, uh, in, d- d- new people, same sin nature. This still happens today. And that's what happens then. So these guys essentially do what always happens during an election season. When, when people are they're trying to figure out who's going to be in charge of who, and, and people are getting jealous of who's been placed in authority over who, what do we do? Uh, we dig. We dig for dirt. You know, all the political parties, that's what they do. You're trying to figure out if you're going to run for office. We're going to find a whole bunch of people that are going to do a really deep, dark background check on you to try to figure out before the other team does what they're going to find. And the other side, they're certainly doing even a bigger, deeper, darker dig to try to figure out all the things in your life. And that's what happens. In verse, verse 4, it says, Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. They did not like that Daniel was placed in authority over them. So they're digging. It says, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. How amazing would it be if we had just a single politician that we could describe this way? You ready? He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. And so they concluded... Our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. (laughs) Here's the the second thing I want you to see from this passage. The second play that the culture is going to play is they're going to try to discredit believers if possible. If you give the culture a reason to count you out, to shut you up, to make it so that nobody cares about any words that come out of your mouth, the culture is going to find it, they're going to dig for it, and they're going to use it against you. If there's something that they can find to say, you know what, yeah, Matt Osdall, that guy is a hypocrite. You don't have to listen to anything he says. They certainly will do that. That's part of their playbook, to discredit people who are following the ways of Jesus. You know, what's hard is that a lot of the world just assumes that when you profess the name of Christ, that what you're saying is, uh, you're, you're not going to find any fault in me. We all know there's not a single perfect person in this room. Every single one of us, if they do a little bit of a dig into us, and we're just honest with them, they're going to find a lot of stuff. Because us Christians, we're not perfect. The only thing that makes us perfect is that Jesus was perfect, and we got access to Jesus. But man, to look at how they're digging and trying to find something to discredit Daniel, it's it's important for us to realize this is what the culture is going to do. They're going to try to discredit you. And here's why. The enemy wants to bring you to your knees. The enemy wants to make you essentially useless in your purpose. The enemy knows that God has given you something incredible to do with your life. And if he can make it so that you can't fulfill that purpose because you've been discredited, disqualified from being able to fulfill it, the enemy will try to find it and use it against you. And that's what they do to Daniel. But here's the thing. (laughs) They find nothing. They look. They look. They interview all the people and they go to Daniel's, you know, elementary school and they're like, tell me, come on, there must have been one time that he cheated on a test. Give me something. And they'd find nothing. Do you know what happens when someone's doing a a dig on you? They're trying to find something against you, but they can find nothing. You know what's going to happen? It's the next culture playbook. They're going to they're going to make something up. If I can't discredit you with something that you actually did, I'm just going to change the rules. I'm going to make it so that you're discredited because I just tweaked the rules a little bit. In fact, that's the next thing: attempt to control people by changing the rules. The culture does this all the time. Everywhere you look in this culture, it seems like every time I turn on the news, it's like, okay, I guess there's a new rule. 
Not allowed to say this anymore. Not allowed to talk like that anymore. Not allowed to do that anymore. The rules are constantly changing. Why? Because when you're a person of character, if they can change the rules, they can then use them against you. And that's what they do to Daniel. Let's look at verse six. It says, so the administrators and the high officers went to the king and they said, you hear like the brown nosing in this, right? Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. I want you to understand that when the culture wants to control you by changing the rules, the way it's going to do that is by this little kind of under the shadow of of secrecy. Those rules, you're going to notice, often get changed in some back room somewhere, and you don't even know that it's happening, and then you just find out that the rules have been changed. Like, how come nobody asked me? This actually happened to me once. I had someone who was trying to discredit me, and they, they wrote a letter to my bosses. And the letter, the rules of this were, listen, I have written this letter, but I will only let you read it as long as Matt is not allowed to see it. <laughs> that didn't go over. But talk about under the shadow of secrecy. Like, Why? Because that's the way the culture works. When someone wants to, to, to discredit you, they'll, they'll change some rules and they'll, they'll do this. But one of the things you're going to notice that I think is really interesting is this next, this number four, the next, the next play in the culture's playbook is the culture will over and over again use deceit when needed to change the rules. The culture is going to lie. The culture loves to lie in order to change the rules. And one of the ways you see this in this passage is they go to King Darius and they say, King Darius, we just want you to know that all of your leaders, all the administrators, all the governors, all of us have talked. And we all agree 100% that you should make a law that we only pray to you for the next 30 days. Y'all listen, Daniel wasn't part of this conversation. I don't think Daniel was sitting there like, all right, what do you guys think? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Let's murder me. (laughs) Daniel was not a part of the conversation. So when they go to the king and they say, king, we want you to create this new law and everybody agrees, all of your leaders think this is a great law. They're using deceit to change the rules. You're going to look around this culture today and you're going to find all sorts of people who are making up stuff out of nowhere, lying about things to change the rules. You know, that, that letter I was talking about, that eventually, you know, we, I was able to see it. We were able to look at its content and basically discredit it as, no, we, we've looked at these things aren't true. Deceit is often part of this process. Give you a little a leadership side note. Any of you love leadership and want a little leadership lesson this morning, it's this. A good leader will often make bad decisions with bad information. You can have a really good leader who makes a bad decision with bad information. It, give you an example of this. When my kids come up to me, and they say, Dad, can I have a sleepover at so-and-so's house? Mom's fine with it, as long as you are. I'm like, well, I'm not going to be the bad guy. If mom's fine with it, I'm okay with it. And then they go over, Mom, can I have a sleepover at so-and-so's house? Dad's fine with it, as long as you are. You know, see, good leaders can make bad decisions with bad information. And I'm not saying Darius was an incredible leader. Obviously, he's about to sign into law that people pray only to him for the next 30 days. That's a bit egotistical. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. It says, And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed 
an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. See, even a good leader will make bad decisions with bad information. Now, here, here's the thing. You have to understand a little bit of the context of this culture. See, in the Medo-Persian Empire, there's kind of this uh, rule. There's this, this kind of un- understood law that when a king, uh, a king is, is essentially un- kind of like a deity. So when a king speaks and a law is made, nothing can change that law. The king can't even revoke it. By the way, there's only one place I know of, there's only one rule book I know of that when the king speaks and puts it on paper that nothing will ever change it, and it's this one. It's not the laws of the Medes and the Persians. But boy, does the culture like to emulate and copycat and counterfeit the law of God. So they have this kind of rule too. Man, when our king speaks, our king is like God. He clearly couldn't get things wrong. So as soon as it's written down, it can't be changed. And that's the law that these Medes and the Persians have. And, and they play into Darius's pride and they play into this rule. And they know they've got Daniel right where they want him. So here's the next part we're going to see. Speaking of the laws being irreversible, the culture's playbook shows no grace and no mercy. Show no grace and show no mercy. You see, the enemy wants to destroy you. Now, we talked on week one that sometimes the culture will act like they're being kind to you. They'll show grace to you. They'll show kindness to you as long as they think they can still win you over to their way of thinking. But as soon as they've got someone like Daniel, as soon as they realize this guy's not going to sit down, he's not going to bow down, he's not going to stop praying to his God, then they show no grace and no mercy. All that goes out the window. And that's what we see here. This law is irreversible. Nothing can change it. But let's see how Daniel responds in verse 10. Man. Daniel, listen to what he does. It says, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed. He went home and knelt down as usual. Nothing changed for him. And then it says, in his upstairs room, with its windows open towards Jerusalem, where everybody can see. And he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Can I challenge you, church, Can we be a place where we as believers are bold in our faith? Where we're publicly known for our allegiance to Christ. We're not afraid. You know, we don't put ourselves in these little cultural like bubbles where nobody has to really know what we all are talking about, what we believe. We have the ability to be in the culture, to be a part of the culture, and to share the truth with grace to the world around us and to stand boldly in alignment with the word of God. And that's what Daniel does. He doesn't back down. Daniel could have easily said, you know what? All right, there's this new law. I'm not allowed to pray to anyone but King Darius. I'll just go into my closet, shut the door, and pray to my God quietly. I don't need to make a big fuss about it. (laughs) But Daniel goes, I'm going upstairs. I'm opening up the windows, and I'm praying just as I did before. He chooses to be bold in his proclamation and recognizing there's only one person that you should be praying to. You know what's interesting, though, is that these guys that had the king sign this into law, they weren't trying to stop Daniel from praying. I want to make sure you know this. They weren't having this law signed to say, hey, let's see if we can get Daniel to stop praying and pray to Darius instead. They knew exactly what Daniel would do the moment this law was signed. They knew Daniel wasn't going to buckle. They knew if we can get the king to sign this law, we can get Daniel thrown into lion's den because Daniel is not going to stop praying to his God. He was known even by his enemy to be a man of character. In fact, that's actually the, the last of these cultural playbook plays I want to show you is that the culture wants to use believers' character against them. If the culture can find a way to recognize you are an upstanding person and you're predictable because you are predictably going to do the right thing every time, the culture can use that and exploit it. And it will. It will try to exploit you in your character. I was trying to think of a a, a recent example of this. Um, 
You know, ever since I started dating my wife, we've been married for 20 years and we dated for probably about two years before that. I've always opened the car door for her. So something, even today, I still do it. My sister reminded me that uh, my, my wife and my sister were out one time and my, my wife walked over to the door and just stood there. My sister's like, what are you doing? She's like, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> anyway. I love to open the car door for my wife. It's just something I do. I saw someone had posted something, and y'all, listen, lead pastors, for whatever reason, we get dragged through the mud sometimes in dark corners of the web. And uh, someone had said about my wife, about me opening the car door for her, uh, it's so sad that he oppresses her that way and she doesn't even realize it. Like, what? What? like some really sick and twisted, unhealthy version of feminism coming out and just saying, he oppresses my, I oppress my wife by opening the car door for her. <laughs> but listen, the, the culture wants to use your character against you. And it will try to do that. So here's what happens in verse 11. It says, then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. Can we pause there for just a second before you keep reading? How do they know who Daniel was praying to? Daniel could have just as much been there sitting on his knees uh, with windows open praying to King Darius like he was supposed to for the next month. Here's how they knew that he wasn't praying to King Darius because he wanted them to know that he was praying to the one true God, so he's praying out loud for everyone to hear it. They knew he was praying to the one true God and not to King Darius because he probably went out of his way to say, oh, the one true God whom I pray to, not the king of this land, King Darius, who is not a god. I'm not praying to him. I'm praying to you. They knew who he was praying to because he was praying out loud. He was praying boldly. And it says, so they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. You can hear the tattletale kind of tone in their voice, right? Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians and cannot be revoked. And then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, they act like he doesn't even know who Daniel is. There's some guy named Daniel. Well, I don't know. He's ignoring your law and he still prays to his God three times a day. Here's a, a parenting lesson for you, parents. When there's a, some sort of argument going on in your home, the first child to come to you is usually the criminal, not the victim. <laughs> you know, that conversation sounds something like, Dad, so-and-so hit me over the, uh, or so-and-so took my truck. Like, oh, that's terrible. Well, let's go talk to your sibling. Did you take her truck? Yes. Why did you take her truck? She was hitting me over the head with it. <laughs> like, listen, the first one to come is usually the criminal. And so the guys come in, they, they do their tattletaling, and we find the king distraught. Let's, let's read about that in verse 14. It says, hearing this, the king was deeply troubled. And he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. I hope you can hear that King Darius really does love and respect Daniel. He has so much admiration for his consistency and his character that he found himself in a really hard spot and says he spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of the predicament. He's probably got all of his legal experts saying, there's got to be some loophole in this, this rule that this Medes and Persians that I rule that. There's got to be a loophole. How can I get Daniel out of this? It says, in the evening, the men went together to the king and said, your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. And then listen to this next part of verse 16. It says, the king said to him, as the king's having him thrown into this den of lions, he says, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. See, he wasn't saying this sarcastically. King Darius 
loved Daniel and he said, listen, I, I hope and I pray. Listen, there's a law that I throw you in this thing. There's no law that I make the lions eat you. I can't wait until they, they get hungry enough and, and devour you. I, I just got to put you in there and I got to put you in there for probably about, you know, a night. But I pray that, that your God will save you. And then we hear a, a stone is rolled over the opening the king is so distraught that evening that he can't sleep. He just has a restless night. And then, then verse, six, uh, verse 19, let's op- uh, start there again. It says, very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? Here's what he's essentially saying right here in this moment. He's saying, Daniel, oh gosh, I hope and I pray that your God is actually a real God. Is your God real? Was your God able to do what, what no other God is capable of doing and saving you from these lions? In verse 21, Daniel answers, long live the king. My God has sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they could not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight. I have, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Listen to this. Not a scratch was found on him for he had trusted in his God. You wanna know what happened to those other guys? Oh, verse 24. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they hit the floor of the den. I know there's still a few verses left in Daniel chapter 6, but here's what I want to, sh- I want to ask you this question. I want to ask you to ask this question to God. Uh, what now? Uh, what do I do with this, this lesson, this, this, this stuff that you're wanting to show me? This, we got to peek into the playbook of, of the culture. What do I do with this information? How do I apply it to my life? And here's the two things I want to challenge you to do as you walk out of here. First of all, every Sunday, don't ever walk out of this place the same way you walked in. What a waste of your Sunday morning. Come in here committed every Sunday to say, I'm going to find something today that I can do so I can be more like Jesus. And here's two things I want to challenge you to consider. The first one is know the enemy's playbook. Watch for these plays. Look for these plays. When they happen to you, you won't be surprised. But even better, know your playbook. I'm holding it right here in my hand. Know your playbook and run the plays. We got like an incredible book that's filled with truth and it shows you the not only the plays of your enemy, but it also tells you how to how to counter, you know, how to counter those plays, the defense to those plays. So know your playbook. And it's not good enough just to know the playbook. You gotta actually then do the plays as they're written, as they're designed. Because what's going to happen if you're consistently faithful, listen to this, when you're consistently faithful, it will lead to an abundant life for you and for those around you. Your faithfulness actually affects those around you, those in your community, those that you impact. In fact, check this out. We're going to wrap up with the last little part of Daniel 6, verse 25. It says, Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. This is what he said. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree. Remember, this is from the the king of the uh, the law of the Medes and the Persians. These, these decrees cannot be revoked, right? He now decrees that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the culture. And then it says this, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You might think, now who's Cyrus? 
We're going to get to that next week. We got one week left in our series through Daniel. And what we're going to see is that Daniel's about 80 years old right now. And he's going to die in his 90s. So we got a little bit of Daniel left. But we're going to hear about how he continues to prosper and be used by God. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the gift that it is to us. Thank you that in it, here in Daniel chapter 6, we can open it up and clearly the playbook that the enemy uses against us. That we get to already know the advances that are coming and how those are going to come so we can be ready to stand boldly and courageously against them. We know that this culture wants to, to control us and that it will make up rules against us. It will try to discredit us from being useful in the purpose that you've given to us. It will show no grace and no mercy in that. It'll do whatever it takes, including lying, to create new rules to try to get us to do what the culture wants us to do. But God, I pray that we'd be a type of people that open up our windows widely, that we get up on the roof, up where everybody can see us and hear us, and we can proudly and boldly proclaim that there is one true God, and we're not praying to or bowing to anyone else. God, help us to be that kind of believer that stands for you and lives in our purpose and recognizing that as we do that, we're going to be on that path that leads to an abundant life, not just for us, but for others. We know the culture is going to use us as men and women of character, and they're going to try to use our character against us, Father, but we recognize you are bigger and better than all that. And then in the end, you are always victorious. And so we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.